We looked at the mechanism of action of antiretroviral agents and what DHHS guideline recommends for treatment of HIV patients. We ensured adherence to ART is optimized and designed an individualized monitoring plan. Now, given a prescription for antiretroviral agents provide patient counseling for adverse effects. All right, let's take a look at the food requirements for these various antiretroviral regimens. For many of these regimens, there is no food requirement, meaning that the patients can take them with or without food. However, note that anytime you have elvitegravir, it needs to be taken with food, as well as anytime you have relpivirin in the regimen. So, uh, you know, ODFC and Complera have relpivirin, so it, that requires food. Juluca also has relpivirin, so because of the relpivirin component, uh, food is required. And also, in general, uh, protease inhibitors, uh, darunavir and etazanavir, they require food. Uh, so... Uh, that's to improve absorption. Efavirenz is the opposite. So efavirenz should actually be taken on empty stomach. And again, for, even for efavirenz, food will increase absorption. But because there are such, uh, you know, uh, neuropsychiatric adverse effects with efavirenz, we actually want to minimize the absorption of efavirenz. So that's why it's recommended to take it on empty stomach. In fact, so much so that more recently, a new formulation of uh, efavirenz came to the market with a lower dose, uh, you know, just to uh, make it more tolerable for patients. Let's take a look at the safety profile of some of these combination regimens. So lamevudine is included in Epsicom and it's generally well tolerated. As a nuke, it generally can cause, you know, general uh, headache, some uh, GI issues, fatigue, insomnia and some increases in liver chemistry, but nothing too serious, uh, you know, including rash. So in general, these are very mild and very well tolerated. Now, these are the newest uh, nukes. Some of the oldest uh, nukes that are no longer used, um, you know, they used to have uh, strong inhi inhibition of DNA polymers in patients, which would lead, lead to lactic acidosis. Uh, so because the mechanism of action is the same, you will see that lactic acidosis uh, will lessen in the package insert of any nukes, uh, but you know, the risk is very minimal. For abacavir, uh, of course, there is a risk of fatal hypersensitivity syndrome. So it is important for patients to have a HLA B5701 allele. Uh, and you know, this actually is, uh, you know, five to 8% prevalent in um, uh, Caucasian population. Symptoms of this uh, hypersensitivity uh, reaction includes uh, fever, abdominal pain, and rash, and usually uh, is within two weeks of starting a bacavir. But because it can be fatal, if this occurs, it must be discontinued. A bacavir must be discontinued. Another issue with a bacavir is that from observational study, some data have suggested that there is increased risk of MI. Now there is mixed data on this, so it's not clear whether the risk is real or uh, you know, it's based on biased studies. But because we have so many other options available, for patients who are uh, you know, at risk of cardiovascular disease, uh, it's best to avoid a bacavir because we have so many other options. Let's take a look at uh, Truvada and Descovy. So tenofovir, uh, you know, in general, if this mnemonic helps, there is a NOF in tenofovir. So N for nephrotoxicity, O for osteotoxicity, and F for Fanconi syndrome, which is, uh, you know, basically um, wasting of electrolytes in the kidney. But Fanconi syndrome is very rare. Now, with osteotoxicity, it's important to note that this is actually talking about bone mineral density loss. It is not myelosuppression. Of course, TAF can reduce um, nephrotoxicity and uh, osteotoxicity with tenofovir. And lastly, m uh, has this unique um, adverse effect of hyperpigmentation in addition to uh, GI adverse effects as well as uh, increased mild increase of liver chemistries. With uh, Stribild and Genvoya, which include Elvitegravir, they should be taken with food. Elvitegravir is generally well tolerated. Uh, one thing that may occur in uh, up to 39% of patients is proteinuria. And the Cobicistat component can actually uh, cause a small increase in serum creatinine. Um, 
you know, which can actually artificially uh, lower uh, GFR. We'll talk more about that uh, in a future lecture. Big Tech Ravier does not need boosting, so it's a much smaller pill. So it's very easy to take. It's once a day um, single tablet regimen, and it's very well tolerated. Uh, now, these are the formulations that include Dalutegravir. So Dalutegravir alone is Tivike, and then, uh, you know, with two nook backbones is Triumek, and then with a single nook backbone is Dovato. And of course, with a non nook uh, you know, Juluka is Dalutegravir plus a non-nucleal uh, non pavirine. Now, in general, Dalutegravir is uh, well tolerated. Uh, one thing that may occur in some patients is insomnia. And also Dalutegravir has been associated with weight gain. And in recent time, more, uh, more data has emerged that, uh, you know, this weight gain can be uh, problematic, especially in patients who already, uh, you know, have issues with pain management and are at risk of cardiovascular disease. Uh, one thing to note with Dovato, because it has a single agent against uh, hepatitis B, there is a black box warning that if someone does have hepatitis B co-infection, there, uh, there has been lamebudine resistant uh, emerge. Uh, so that's important to screen patients for hep B and uh, make sure that the patients do not have hep B co-infection uh, when using this regimen. Icentrus, which is raltegravir, uh, one, you know, this was one of the oldest integrase inhibitors. The issue is that you have to take it twice a day, so it makes it, um, you know, challenging for adherence. A more uh, recently, a higher dose, so HD is for higher dose, came to the market. So uh, basically, you can do it once a day. But still, this, you know, these are uh, pretty much uh, big pills, and you, the patients have to take two pills uh, once a day. And uh, one unique uh, adverse effect of raltegravir is CPK elevation. So this is, uh, you know, if you remember from daptomycin, can also increase CPK. So that's something to keep an eye on with uh, raltegravir as well. Now, more recently, uh, cabotegravir was approved, uh, you know, in combination with uh, relpeverine. Now, these are monthly injections. They are co-packaged, but they're actually separate vials. So the patient will get one injection of cabotegravir and one injection of uh, uh, relpeverine. Uh, but this is for people who already have received another ART and the viral load is uh, undetectable. And then they can take about a month of oral cabotegravir plus oral uh, relpeverine just to make sure that they can tolerate it. Uh, this is intended to improve adherence and also to help with stigma associated with HIV because patients no longer have to have a bottle of pills. Uh, you know, at home, they don't have to go to a pharmacy to refill their pills. What they have to do is once a month, uh, you know, go see their primary care physician or their HIV um, doctor and get these injections. These are intramuscular injections in the gluteal muscles. So it has to be done by the physicians. Now, anytime you have uh, protease inhibitors, so darunavir and etazanavir, they have to be taken with food. Darunavir specifically is a sulfa drug. So, you know, we have discussed sulfa allergy before. It's not necessarily a contraindication, but something to be cautious, you know, be, especially if you have so many other options. And, you know, someone has sulfa allergy, uh, you know, you can uh, use uh, something else because adherence is extremely important. So the last thing you want is someone is having a reaction because of this sulfa reaction and they stop taking it. Now, with uh, protease inhibitors, typically uh, dyslipidemia uh, can occur. So especially increased triglyceride and cholesterol. So that's something... Uh, to keep an eye on, especially with HIV patients, uh, you know, HIV, HIV itself is a risk factor for cardiovascular uh, disease. Uh, one more thing with etazanavir is that a unique adverse effect is unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Uh, so that's something to monitor when patients are on etazanavir. Uh, you know, which uh, basically, uh, you know, some of the manifestations is, you know, when they have hyperbilirubinemia, they, they can actually start to look, uh, ye have a yellowish color. Uh, so, you know, some um, clinicians call this a banana veer, uh, you know, referring to the yellow color.
but you know given that we have so many other options they're really not a good reason for people to be on etazanavir uh, anymore relpeverine should also be taken with food and uh, you know uh, the non-nukes are only active against hiv1 they don't have activity against hiv2 uh, you know which in general is not an issue because hiv1 is the most uh, by far the most common um, virus in the u.s and uh, you know it can cause rash hepatotoxicity uh, hyper uh, lipidemia uh, so this also includes increased in uh, triglyceride as well as increased ldl um, and if patients were to overdose or achieve supratherapeutic concentration, it has, uh, real pevering can also cause QTC prolongation. Efavirenz, uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, should be taken on empty stomach because food increases its level to unsafe levels and there are serious adverse effects, so including, uh, you know, uh, depression and suicidality, including people who attempted suicide. So it's a very serious adverse effect. Uh, so it's uh, you know important that the patient take it on empty stomach or if they are at if they already have uh, you know psych uh, issues at baseline you know in general it's best to avoid this regimen but if you know there is no other option for the patient uh, the lower dose is an option uh, CNS side effects uh, you know occur in up to half of the patients uh, and basically uh, they resolve after two to four weeks. Uh, so, so you know, these are general CNS uh, side effects such as confusion, uh, abnormal dreams, uh, somnolence, impaired concentration, and occasionally severe depression. Now, one thing that also helps with abnormal dreams is if we tell the patient to take this at bedtime, uh, you know, because if you take it in the morning or throughout the day, uh, by the time it's bedtime, uh, the drug is in the system and it can cause uh, vivid dreams. And these dreams are, you know, very problematic. Patients remember them and, uh, you know, it can be uh, very problematic. So one strategy is to, you know, if someone develops um, vivid dreams, to take it at bedtime because by the time the drug kicks in and you have sufficient concentrations in the blood, you know, it's almost morning, so the patient is waking up, so there is less likely to be, uh, you know, those um, vivid abnormal dreams. And lastly, we have Duraverin, uh, which is also a non nuc that was recently came, uh, approved. And it, compared to other non nuc it has improved safety profile, including less neuropsychiatric side effects. Um, as well as better lipid profile. In fact, it does not increase LDL and triglyceride, and it's also been shown to, if anything, it's going to reduce or lower LDL and triglyceride levels. And may, it may also, uh, on the other hand, increase HDL uh, level. So, you know, from a lipid profile, uh, it, this drug seems uh, pretty good, uh, you know, given that HIV patients are at risk of cardiovascular disease. The other advantage of this drug is higher barrier to resistance, including it, uh, you know, it has been shown to maintain its activity against uh, viruses that are resistant to efavirenz or uh, relpeverin, for example. Currently, it's uh, considered alternative because of limited data. So it's only been on the market for a couple of years. So, you know, in time, it's likely that, you know, either it becomes, um, you know, first line or, uh, you know, it might find its niche for, uh, patients who have resistant developed uh, to other uh, non-nukes. This concludes this presentation.